Today's episode is sponsored in part by MindMeister, my favorite online collaboration tool for brainstorming, organizing your thoughts, creating presentations, and so much more. MindMeister is the world-leading mind mapping solution with over 7 million users, including SAP, Oracle, CNN, Philips, and Vodafone, and has been recommended by the New York Times, Forbes Magazine, Zapier, Lifehacker, Entrepreneur, CIO, Business Insider, and of course, the PM for the Masses podcast. You can get 10% off any paid plan by using my special discount code MASSES, M-A-S-S-E-S, MASSES. You can go to mindmeister.com to get started, and don't forget to use the coupon code MASSES at checkout. Project managers, have you ever felt like you should get that promotion or a better job? Start a business, write that book. Have you ever felt you were made for more but didn't know where to start? Welcome to the PM for the Masses podcast with your host, Caesar Abade. Learn from the experts, think outside the box, have a voice, network, and be extraordinary. PM for the Masses podcast. Hello, everybody, once again, and welcome. I'm Cesar Abade, your host, and this show, as usual, is your regular reminder that your career matters more than your job, and that your life is a project, and you are the manager. Whether you work for a company or for yourself, your job stability is really just your ability to land your next gig. So, join me in practicing intentional, planned, and value-adding relevance, starting right now. Today... I'm going to bring you <laughs> one of my favorite conversations I've ever had in this podcast. I'm going to introduce you to an accomplished CEO who lost a CEO's most powerful tool, which is his voice. But what he has found in the process of dealing with this loss is truly remarkable. Kevin Hancock is an award-winning author, speaker, and CEO. Established in 1848, Hancock Lumber Company operates 10 retail stores, three sawmills, and a truss plant. The company also grows trees on 12,000 acres of timberland in southern Maine and is led by its 550 employees. Hancock Lumber is a six-time recipient of the Best Places to Work in Maine Award. The company is also a recipient of the Maine Family Business of the Year Award, the Governor's Award for Business Excellence, the MITC Exporter of the Year Award, and the Pro Sales National Dealer of the Year. Kevin is a past chairman of the National Lumber and Building Materials Dealer Association. He's also a recipient of the Ed Muskie Access to Justice Award, the Habitat for Humanity Spirit of Humanity Award, the Boy Scouts of America Distinguished Citizen Award, and Timber Processing Magazine's Man of the Year Award. His first book, Not for Sale, Finding Center in the Land of Crazy Horse, won three National Book Awards. His second book, The Seventh Power, One CEO's Journey into the Business of Shared Leadership, uh, was released in February 25th of this year, 2020, and uh, I just finished it. It's a fantastic book. Kevin is a frequent visitor to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, which features prominently in his book, and an advocate of strengthening the voices of all individuals within a company or a community through listening, empowering, and shared leadership. Kevin is a graduate of Lake Region High School and Bowdoin College, and he's on the line with me from his office in Maine. Good morning, Kevin. How are you? I am doing great thank you so much for having me on your show wow it's a pleasure you know i i read your book and we've been trying to you know make this happen for a while and we've been playing uh internet tag if that's a thing but <laughs> so i'm glad that we were able to uh come together today to talk about uh the seventh power and your journey so let's start let's start with um you know, first of all, I, I did read your book and you talk about your journey um, and you start by talking about um, SD and how it changed your life and it mainly affected your voice. So let's talk about that first. What is SD and, and how did that happen? Yeah, uh, sure. So SD is short for spasmodic dysphonia, which is a very rare uh, 
neurological voice disorder that affects only speech with no known cause and no known cure. And I uh, acquired the disorder back in 2010 at the right about at the peak of the housing and mortgage market collapse. And I'm the uh, CEO of a lumber company in Maine. And so it was a really difficult time for our industry and company and employees and customers. And suddenly right at the peak of it, I couldn't really use my voice, something I'd always uh, take it for granted. And as a CEO used a lot, you know, when you think about it, when you're leading a company in some ways, your primary tool is your voice. And suddenly I couldn't really use it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That is, um, and that, you know, it's, it's interesting. So I, I, I listened to the book on audiobook, you know, and, uh, and it's it's very different now that I'm listening to you, you know, to and it makes it a, a lot more real. You know? <laughs> um, so uh, this is uh, the great insight. I think one of the great insights I think of the book is how, as your, um, you know, you were your speech was challenged, you were forced to listen more. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. It was quite simple at the time when <laughs> um, when it gets hard to talk, you develop strategies for doing less of it. <laughs> right. And and mine was to answer a question with a question, thereby putting the conversation back on the other person. So you can picture the kind of age old timeless scene at work where someone comes up to the uh, supervisor or the boss or in my case the CEO with a question or a problem and I started responding uh, essentially by saying gee that is a great question what do you think we should do about it <laughs> and uh, while initially this was just a strategy to protect my own voice, what really struck me over time, having done this, you know, say for months, was that people already knew what to do. Like they had great answers already in terms of how to fix or address the problems and the challenges that they faced, it turned out they didn't really need, after all, most of the time, a top-down directive. They knew what to do. What they really needed was simply the encouragement and the safety to trust and follow their own voice. And so out of that came this I had a bit of a personal and then leadership epiphany where I was like, well, maybe this partial loss of my own voice, which I'd always thought about initially as a kind of a hindrance or a liability or quite literally a pain in the neck. Maybe it was something different. Maybe it was an invitation to lead differently in a way that gave other people a stronger voice. And that's what really got me on the track of what I've come to talk about simply as a, a shared leadership culture where the power is dispersed, where everybody leads and where every voice is trusted, respected and heard. That is such a great insight, and I couldn't agree more. One thing that I um, that I have uh, figured this was uh, I don't know like fifteen twenty years ago, <laughs> is that uh, I I I tried to make a a list of the people that I liked the most and see what they had in common because I was trying to be better, right? And uh, and the one thing that every the, all the people that I liked had in common was that they let me talk. You know, um, and this is an exercise to do, you know, even, even with my kids, you know, like usually, um, by letting 
the other person talk, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they learn to relate to you better. And, and today, you know, I, I still think that that's the case and, and I'm guilty. I mean, I have a podcast, of course, I like love to talk. Um, but, uh, learning to, I mean, in your case, you had, we had a little choice there, but you know, maybe that was the trigger for you, but, um, for anybody listening, you know, um, you can learn just so much more by listening to people rather than talking. And I think you talk, oh. you talk about that in the book as well. Yeah. Oh, I love that point. I, I wrote that down when you said it. That's so interesting that, that all these people had that in common. They really honored your voice i think that's lovely and it makes me think about what really kind of became the next big step in in our approach to give everybody a voice which is really to think about why and how we listen and i talk about this in the in the book but i would summarize it simply this way listening is for understanding, not judgment. So it's one thing to listen, but it's really important to think about why you're listening. Earlier in my career, when I was younger, before my voice condition, in upon reflection, I think I really often listened to judge what I was hearing and see if I liked it or I didn't. But now the real focus I have for our company and all the work I do is that listening is simply for understanding. And it's really that whole notion of getting beyond right and wrong and just meeting people where they are and making it safe for everybody to just honor their own voice in place. When I think about it today, I I think about it this way. Our company has 550 employees, people who work at the company, and there is no single truth about the company. The company is a manifestation of what all 550 of them think and the greatest gift you can give an organization i think is uh, to make it safe for people to actually say what they think so let me take a minute to talk about my favorite remote collaborating tool it's called mindmeister and it's a mind mapping application mindmeister is a completely web-based mind mapping software that runs in any standard web browser So the mind maps you create are saved automatically in the cloud online and can be accessed from anywhere. If you don't know what a mind map is, think of it as a free flowing visual outline tool that can be used for anything you want. So I've been using MindMeister for 10 years now. It is by far my favorite tool for organizing my thoughts, for sharing my thoughts with, uh, with my team and also for collaborating with other people. So for example, it is a perfect tool for you to create a WPS, a work breakdown structure. It's beautifully laid out, it's all online, and it's a wonderful company. So aside from the web app, MindMeister also offers native mobile apps for iPhone, iPad, even Apple Watch and Android devices, which means that you can access, edit, and present your maps no matter where you are. MindMeister was made as intuitive and as fast as possible to ensure that you can fully concentrate on the creative task at hand. So there's no clutter, no friction, just your team and your ideas. And speaking of teams, unlike traditional mind mapping tools, MindMeister lets you brainstorm in real time with an unlimited number of users. So I do this all the time. I'll, I'll, I'll brainstorm something by myself using a mind map, and then I share that with my coworkers who are far away, and they hop in and they help me out with brainstorming and moving things around. It's really cool. And MindMeister has a special code that will give you a 10% discount for my audience. If you go to pmforthemasses.com slash mindmap, pmforthemasses.com slash mindmap, if you sign up for any of the paid accounts, you can put in the code masses, as in PM for the masses, so masses, and you'll get 10% off. And you don't even need to upgrade to a paid plan because MindMeister offers 
a free plan that uh, it's a bit limited, but you can try it out. And then if you like it and you want to upgrade, you can use that code. That's a great way for you to get started. And if you do upgrade, it's a great way to uh, support this podcast. And also you will let, you, let them know, the folks at MindMeister, that you heard about MindMeister here on the PM for the Masses podcast. So again, pmforthemasses.com slash mindmap and enter the code masses for 10% off. Now back to the show. Um, just, you know, a few episodes back, I talked about biomimicry and uh, that is like, you know, looking to nature for models. And uh, in your book, you talked about, you know, you just mentioned that power is dispersed and in nature, that's how power is executed, is dispersed. Uh, talk, and, and then, you know, uh, th that also ties in with uh, letting people have a voice. And so what, what do you mean by saying that power is dispersed and how is, how does that happen in nature, for example, and how can we mimic that? Yeah. Great question. And I love that phrase, biomimicry. I've written that down too. I'm learning a lot from you this morning. I love this. <laughs> but I had an uh, experience that was really powerful a few years ago. I had been thinking a lot about a new leadership model that kind of flipped the script on the traditional approach of power to the center and instead dispersed power. And I was, had been doing a little bit of work on the Navajo reservation in Arizona actually, and was taking a walk in the desert at sunset when this epiphany or moment of clarity hit me. These uh, five words just plopped into my head and stopped me in my tracks. And those words were, in nature, power is dispersed. And I stopped and I looked around and I, and I actually began a dialogue with the desert. It was only me in the desert, but I started asking out loud a series of leadership questions. I said something like this. I said, where's the, the capital of this desert? Where is its headquarters? Where are the managers and the supervisors? Where is the CEO? There was a cluster of cactuses nearby, and I turned that way and said, which one of you cactuses is in charge of all the others? And the answer, of course, uh, in each case was just powerfully clear. The, the leadership uh, power of nature is scattered and diffused. It lives in all of nature's parts and pieces, big and small. And here's the, the connection or the link back to what we're talking about. Humans who are part of nature, not detached from it, ultimately aspire to organize in this same way that the long arc of humanity is headed towards a dispersed leadership model where every individual's sacred voice is really honored and where leadership is um, shared, but that's quite a, quite a, a transition that we're going to need to make from the traditional past based model of power to the center and leadership by a few. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was a, a really good insight. And I, <laughs> I love that. The, the, the image of you talking to the cactus. That's, that's great. Um, the, the, an, another thing that really stuck with me when I read your book was um, you you say that um, a lot of folks believe that the best companies out there, they are the best companies because they have the best people. And this is something I believed until I read your book as well. Um, yeah, I happened to work at a great company and I, you know, as soon as I joined it, I said, oh my goodness, I'm, this is, this is a great bunch of people you know they're really 
uh, amazing and even feel a little um, out of place, you know, so I need to, I need to, you know, grow a little bit to actually <laughs> be at the same level as them. <laughs> and, and you say that, you know, uh, that's not the case. That, I mean, it is the case that companies have good people, but not, it's not what makes them uh, the best companies, right? Yeah, that's a really interesting subject. And I um, made the same kind of leap in thinking that you're talking about. We used to have T-shirts at our company that said, our people make the difference. You've probably seen that slogan at other places through the years. And as much as I hope you can tell I love and honor people, I don't actually think that uh, slogan is quite true anymore. I've come to believe that great people are actually everywhere, that the planet is filled with great people. And it's really the culture or the platform that they're uh, living in or working in that makes the difference, that either allows them to thrive or makes it difficult to do so. And I used to teach uh, history, and I got thinking about history in this question, and I really think that history uh, plays this out. So I so think, for example, about, say, Germany after World War II, which was arbitrarily divided into two countries, a West Germany and an East Germany. And of course, West Germany was democratic and free and innovative, and it went on to really help propel the entire planet forward in the decades after the war. And East Germany, conversely, focused on the kind of the Soviet approach to leadership, very, very centralized, one monolithic voice kind of hung on under uh, barbed wire and attack dogs and machine gun turrets until it collapsed under its own weight. But would anybody really think that... Um, that all the, say, the best Germans happen to be on the west side of that arbitrary line, and the, I don't even know how you'd say it, the less best Germans happen to be in the east. Of course not. Germany was filled with great people on both sides of that line. It was the leadership culture that made the difference. We see this today in North and South Korea. I believe the South Korean economy is something like 40 times larger than the North Korean economy. But certainly that's not because randomly all the best Koreans ended up south of the line. Again, it's the culture. Culture makes the difference. And to me, simply put, a leadership culture either collects power or it disperses it. Amazing. Yeah. That is a great insight. I, I remember seeing a picture once. Uh, uh, it's a satellite image of... Um, of the Korean Peninsula at night, and uh, and you can totally see where the border is just by the just by the lights from the cities because South Korea is just like this looks like a Christmas tree, you know, um, and then in North Korea is total darkness and it's like and it's the same people. I mean, it, it, it they're the same. You're you're so right. Just like the Germans, right? Are the same and people. what a I love that image. What a great visual image, right? One side of that line, there's light, yeah. and the other side of that line, there's darkness. Right. Yes, that's a that's a good way of putting it. You you're good at this, Kevin. <laughs> uh, well, you are too. So it's really uh, it's just so fun to be with you. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So um, on that note, um, you mentioned in the book that work can be an incubator of societal change. And this is something I've, I've thought a lot about because, you know, you don't see a whole lot of countries 
experimenting with culture changes, right? I mean, they, they have a job to do, which is, you know, keep the lights on and the enemies out or whatever their countries are doing. Um, while companies, they're much more nimble and they're, you know, being born every day and it's a lot easier to experiment. So how can we, you know, let, let's see you work for a company that has a good culture. Um, how can that... Uh, escape the borders of the company and start permeating um, your local community, for example? Yeah, what an important question. There is so much there. I, I start by really thinking about what should the purpose and mission of work be in the 21st century. You know, it's highest calling and i think simply put it should be to advance humanity how do you advance humanity i think at the end of the day you do it one person at a time so for me that means a company should really focus on the well-being not just economic, but I'm talking spiritual, emotional sense of purpose and meaning of the people who work there. I talk about this as creating an employee centric company where the first focus is the experience of the people who work there. And if the company provides a meaningful experience for the employees, pretty much everything else, including customer care and corporate performance will take care of itself. Now, at a high level, that gets me thinking about how you, how we create change to your question. And I've really come to believe uh, it happens in three steps. And I would summarize it this way, within you, beside you, and then beyond you. That first step is the big one, and this is what really happened to me with my own voice condition. It triggered me to change, to become something a bit different, and to see the world differently, and to change my view of leadership and what the purpose of our company was. That then allowed me and then us to invest what's been now a decade in trying to create a, you know, really high quality work experience for the people of our company to give them a voice. If all those people have a voice, then that uh, ripples forward and creates opportunities like the one I have to be talking with you today. But I would also maybe sum it up this way when we think about changing and advancing humanity uh i think about it with a simple question what if everybody on earth felt trusted respected valued and heard what do you think might change right. <laughs> yeah uh, you know, uh, you know that that answers a, a follow-up question I, I had for you. I think I think um, you know you mentioned advancing uh, advancing society and, and humanity, and I think one of the problems we have today is that we we don't agree what that means. You know, um, progress means something to you; it means something different to me. Or, uh, and I think we used to have uh, a common. Uh, understanding of you know <laughs> what good was for example right and now i think yes. people have different ideas so uh do you think that it that is the common denominator you know like uh, mutual respect and understanding because then we can talk about things i do mm -hmm. i do i think that is a platform we can we can build on helping everybody feel trusted, respected, valued, and heard as they are. Another way I think about that is honoring everybody's voice. I've thought a lot about the, the unanswerable question, what's the purpose of a 
human life on earth. And I've come to uh, ponder that perhaps it's to self actualize. Mm. Maybe we're all here just trying to find our own unique, never to be repeated voice, which to me means the essence of who we are at a soul's level. And to bring that voice forward into our lives and to know it, live it, love it, and gift it, if you will, to the collective consciousness of humanity. But what really has gotten me animated about trying to create a new approach to leadership is I think that across time leaders have probably done more to limit restrict and direct the voices of others than to free them right yeah I agree and um, I, I, I like that you know the uniqueness because I think ultimately um, you like yourself as a person is the only. It's the is the you're the only one who can provide that to the world. The the gift of you. <laughs> um and yes uh, and and if you if we believe that everybody has a place, then uh, then you're irreplaceable, right? Right, and that brings me back to the to the place of work and why I think it can play such a transformational role in the future of, of humanity. Where are adults going to have a forum to self-actualize? I mean, we understand that young people uh, do this at home and at school, but how about adults? You know, so in the place of work is r really the most likely forum for adults to self-actualize first because so many people work. In other words, that's where the adults are. <laughs> and second, because uh, companies can really thrive uh, by creating that kind of culture. So I love uh, an idea where everybody wins. I've really thought a lot about winning in the 21st century too and what it means. And I think that winning is no longer winning unless everybody's winning. <laughs> so you need strategies that benefit everybody and honoring an individual's voice is great for every individual within a company, but then it also positions the company to just soar in ways that it uh, that otherwise could not be possible. I agree. You know, one of my favorite things uh, is when um, somebody on my team, you know, when, when talking to them in one-on-ones, um, will tell me what, what their dreams are. You know, what like what they really would like to be doing in five years because that you know, that's amazing to me because now I can sit down and say, All right, let's let's plan this, you know. And sometimes it means uh them having to leave the company eventually, you know. And and I think it's worth it, right? <laughs> to to yes. help help the individual self uh actualize, like you say, and um and be fulfilled and happy because uh, you know, in in the end, they, they'll do better work if they're feeling like that, right? Cor correct. Yeah, I love that approach. And, and it really, I think, is a great example what you just described of where we want to head. In the old traditional model, the empire came first. The company, the uh, nation, state, or whatever it was, in the new model, I think companies need to learn to serve and honor the individuals who work there. And then a outcome of that focus will be the company's performance will uh, expand, but it's really the byproduct of a higher calling, which is honoring the individual human spirit, which is what that phrase 
the seventh power is meant to represent. That's actually a, a Sioux concept from the, the, the uh, Sioux tribes on the American uh, Northern Plains there sacred symbol is the medicine wheel and it honors the uh, powers of the west north east south sky and earth but the center of that medicine wheel the axis lives the seventh power and that power is you it's me it's the individual human spirit we're all uh related everything that exists is related and it's all made up of the same sacred start dust or energy or whatever you'd like to call it so a piece of that divine is within us all and this this conversation we're having is really about releasing the power of the individual human spirit that is that's great because I was going to ask you about the seventh power. So that's that's fantastic, and uh, you know I when I was reading your book, I I well, you know it got to that part, and I because I I'm come from a faith background, you know I'm Catholic, <laughs> and uh, so I at first I was like, huh, decent, you know the you know the individual, and but I think that fits as well, like with. I think and then I started to think about other faith uh, traditions and non no faith at all. You know, I, I think it fits with all those because even even in Christianity, for example, right? We we are taught that we were made in the image of God, so the divine is within us in some aspect, right? Yeah. Yes. So there is a lot of truth in that in that nugget of wisdom there from the from the Sioux and and um, and that is the seventh power. It's amazing. So, uh, Kevin, um, let's see. Let's say there's a there's a project manager or a team manager listening right now that's dealing with, uh, you know, they're, let's say they're not happy with the company culture or their team culture. Is there something that can they can, you know, as soon as they press stop here, go back to work, <laughs> uh, that they can <laughs> something they can do today uh, that they can start going down that path to 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 make a change in their work environment and as a result in, in their community and society? Great question. And I believe the answer is yes, there is. And for me, it's uh, embodied by that iconic quote of Gandhi's, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. My favorite simple exercise is to think about a way in which you'd like to see your company, its culture, or your work team be different, and then pretty much put all your energy into just becoming and manifesting that change and see if you can create a ripple. At the end of the day, the only person we really can change is ourselves. So it really becomes a, a, a quest of looking inward, of manifesting what you want to see, and then watching it uh, mimic itself in the world around you. That's great. Kevin, this was fantastic. So uh, for folks who want, to, who want to learn more about you, about your company, about your book, where should they go? Well, I'd love to hear uh, from anybody who listened to this talk and um, had thoughts come from it. And you can reach me through my website, which is simply Kevin D. Hancock. Dot com. There are lots of resources there. You can access my books there and you can access me there. Perfect. And I'll have links to, to your website and to your book as well as, um, as you know, some of the, the things we talked about here on the, the show notes for today's episode at pmforthemasses.com slash 134 for episode 134. Again, pmforthemasses.com slash 134. 
Kevin, what a pleasure, what a delight has been to talk to you. Thank you so much for making the time today. Thank you. It's really my pleasure to be with you. I enjoyed it greatly. Thank you for listening to the PM for the Masses podcast. Tune in next week for more great ideas on how to manage your projects better and truly stand out in your industry. PM for the Masses.com.